In this video, we are going to discuss cycles. Cycles occur when you see rises and falls in the data that are not of a fixed frequency. They are thus very difficult to predict. Cycles are usually longer term shifts from the trend in the data. You can have a peak above the trend, a valley below the trend, or a succession of both. The duration between these peaks and valleys can shift. You might have peaks succeeding each other or valleys succeeding each other. There is no absolute rule about this. The width of each peak and valley can also differ. You might have only one or two repetition of such peak or valley in a data set, unlike seasonality, where usually you have many repetitions. They can be much harder to detect. If you look at the graph here, you have the S&P 500, and you can see that roughly you have an exponential trend, right? It grows slowly at the beginning, and then as you move forward, it grows faster and faster. And you can see that at some points in the data, the line moves above the expected trend, and then it comes back, and then it moves above again. So you have two peaks, one after the other, and then it might go a bit below and start rising again. So it is kind of hard to predict, otherwise we will all make a lot of money, of course, uh, but we have to take them into account when we are analyzing the data. How to identify these peaks and valleys, so these cycles, in the data we have. So once we run our regression and control for both the trend and the seasonality, we can look at the residual and we can see clear patterns there we can see that the residuals uh, in the mid 90s are a bit below the zero line and then they go above and then they fall again a bit more below in the early 2000s but these are not large cycles they are not large uh, deviation and then we see an increase around 2005 and a big shock uh, in 2008 where the all the residuals fall below the line so they are way below the expectations that's a big downward cycle which gets corrected uh, in 2010-2015 and then around 2020 we see that most of the residuals are above uh, the predicted values so uh, we are in an upward cycle. Controlling and accounting for cycles in our model is more difficult, right? When we have accounted for the trend and the seasonality the remaining autocorrelation in the residuals is usually from the cycle and it's still there because we couldn't predict the cycle. There are two main methods for handling cycle. The first and probably the best method is to find a leading indicator. A leading indicator is an explanatory variable that changes before the cycle changes. It allows us to predict that the cycle is about to change and therefore it can be incorporated in, in uh, the model. Now, the challenge with leading indicators is that they are incredibly difficult to find because they are basically variables that move before the cycle changes in our dependent variable. It isn't easy when cycles are caused mostly by microeconomic indicators that tend to move together, such as GDP, unemployment, or inflation. None of these indicators move before the other indicators that we might be interested in, such as retail sales. There are instances where people have found leading indicators for macroeconomic cycles. One example that comes to mind is from Alan Greenspan, the former chairman of the US Federal Reserve. He used the sales of men's underwear to help predict change, uh, a change in the economic cycle. The intuition for this was that during periods of stability, when the economy is doing well, Men's underwear is generally considered to be a staple. We'll purchase it as we need it, replacing old pairs uh, and so on and so forth. However, there are cases where people tend to be fairly good at predicting uh, future income streams, particularly their own future income streams. And so when people predict that their future income is going to take a hit, it's going to get worse, they will constrain their current period spending and one way that men will do that is that they will forego replacing their old underwear. They have a set and they'll stick with it. This allowed the sales of men, uh, men's underwear to predict when the US economy might be entering a down cycle. It also works in reverse. When individuals feel that their future income is going to increase, they are more likely to spend money. And so men are more likely to regularly replace their underwear in that case. 
The second method that's used to control for cycles is to use lag dependent variables. So if uh, you are interested in retail sales, you might put in your model the retail sales of two months ago, for instance. The problem with both of these methods is that they constrain how far in advance you can predict. If your leading indicator such as men underwear spending is uh, moving, is predicting the change of the cycle maybe two months ahead, you can only predict that cycle and see it coming two months ahead. Same with a uh, lag dependent variable terms. If you put a lag that's two term behind, it will only react two months uh, after your cycle started if you are counting in month. And so you will not see the cycle coming. It's not predicting any future cycle. It's not, it's just uh, reacting after. So how to add these uh, additional controls in your models that already include seasonality and trend? Well, you can just add the either the leading indicator if you have one or the lag term to your equation. So now you have the trend that is represented by T, which represents the number of periods since the first observation. You have the seasonality represented by the indicator variables, so the i, which are zero if you are out of the season and one if they are in the current season, represented by that specific indicator. And then you have the lag term, uh, so y t minus p, where p is uh, the number of periods in the past. So here we have y t minus seven, so we put the dependent variable but seven period behind and the corresponding term uh, beta lag seven is interpreted as the impact of a one unit change in the value of yt seven periods ago on the expected value of the current yt. Note that you can use more than one, uh, one lag term in a model. So you could put uh, one yt minus one, yt minus two, yt minus three, and so on and so forth. So I did exactly that with our model predicting uh, retail sales. So I have the date, which is for the trend. And then I have only three indicators for seasonality, December, January, and February. And then I put a lagged variable, uh, which is the retail sales, but two periods ago. So two months uh, behind. You can see that all these terms are pretty significant or like heavily significant actually. They are, have a p-value that is below uh, 2 times 10 to the power of minus 16. So we should all keep them in the model. How does that look in terms of prediction? Well, it seems that now we are fitting the data pretty well. The trend is uh, correct. Uh, we are following uh, the upward trend pretty linearly. And then we have the seasonality that matches the peak and the valleys that are regular. Every uh, year we have December uh, that is high and January, February that is low. And the cycles are also accounted for, especially the big shock in 2008. You can see that our prediction shifts down to account for that shock. Now, again, because we integrated a lag that's two months behind, we can only uh, predict or observe the change in cycles if we have the data up to two months before what we are trying to predict. So we cannot predict more than two months ahead. We can see that uh, at the end of this data set, after 2020, we actually have a kind of cycle going up, but our prediction didn't adapt yet and they are still following the trend. So we are making wrong predictions here and we will think that it will adapt once we have the data uh, going forward. So it will adapt just two months late. In terms of residuals, we can see that they are a lot better. Uh, now for most of the time series, they are centered on zero, on the black line. So it's good. Uh, we shouldn't be able to predict if a residual is above or below. Now for the shock in 2008, we can see that it's still there. After 2008, the residuals are mostly below the black line, but this doesn't last for long because the lag term will take care of this and correct the prediction. And then all the residuals come back around zero. It's the same for uh, the 2020 and after period where most of the residuals are above the line, but we'll expect that going on forward, uh, the lag term will take care of this uh, also, and our prediction will become better with all the residuals being around zero.